Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Open our lips, O Lord. And we shall declare your praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Friends in Christ, we come together to meet with God and to take our part in the building up of his church. We lift up our hearts in thanks and praise, hear from God's holy word, and pray for this world and for ourselves. The Bible tells us to approach God confidently through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we do so, we must confess our sins, seeking forgiveness through God's boundless goodness and mercy. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and pray together. God of all mercy, we humbly admit that we need your help. We have wandered from your way. We have sinned in thought, word and deed and have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of your Spirit that we may live the new life to your glory. This we ask in the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen. God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. As Paul says to us in Romans, Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Grace and peace be with you. And also with you. The first reading is from St Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. So then... Putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbours, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labour and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you are marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here ends the first lesson. The Venita. Psalm 95 O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving. And cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God. And a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. And the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. And kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the wilderness. When your forebears tested me. Put me to proof, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I loathed that generation and said. It is a people who err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways. Of whom I swore in my wrath. They shall never enter my rest. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
The second reading is from the Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Here ends the second lesson. The Benedictus, the Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Who has come to his people and set them free. The Lord has raised up for us a mighty Saviour. Born of the house of his servant David. Through the holy prophets, God promised of old. To save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. To show mercy to our forebears. And to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham. To set us free from the hands of our enemies. Free to worship him without fear. Holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. To give his people knowledge of salvation. By the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God. The dawn from on high shall break upon us. To shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. And to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At the beginning of my homily today, I would like to sincerely thank Robin Whitaker, a friend and professor at Pilgrim Theological College, for an article she published during the week and to which I have drawn heavily upon in this homily. Thank you very much, Robin. As we reflect on today's second reading, our reading from the Gospel, it might be helpful to recap some of what we've heard over the last few weeks as we have progressed through this section in John's Gospel. After the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on top of the waters of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus goes home to his adopted home at Capernaum. People who had eaten the miraculous bread and fish follow him home. These are the same people who had tried to make Jesus their king after the miracle, and Jesus had escaped them. When they show up in Capernaum, Jesus knows instantly that they have come expecting another free feed. You may remember Jesus' words at the beginning 
of last week's gospel. While this might seem a little rude, it was certainly not without precedent in the ancient world. In the ancient world, to show how great and gracious they apparently were, the Roman emperors would give free food and entertainment to the masses of Rome. This is summed up uh, still in the phrase bread and circuses. The logic was that if you could shut them up with food and keep them entertained, it really didn't matter what you did or how awful you were. I wonder if anything has changed. So the crowds show up in Capernaum, expecting Jesus to show them just how great he is. Jesus tell, tells them that they haven't shown up because they believe in him, but because they think he's a divine vending machine. So the crowds respond, do something then, show us a sign. We'll see, we'll weigh the evidence, we'll draw the conclusions, and we might even decide if we believe. Our ancestors ate manna when they came out of Egypt. Come on, what can you do? Jesus responds, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. Father Fergus King, reflecting on this sixth chapter of John, wrote the following. It is a passage which places the feeding of the 5,000 at the, right at the beginning of John's reflection on Jesus as the bread of life, a theme which will extend throughout the rest of the chapter, provoking reflections on the meaning of bread of life in Old Testament traditions and on sacraments in merging Christianity. It is a heady mix. The feeding story is the first movement in a symphony which will explain Jesus as bread and the author, and author of a new rite in which he becomes the sustenance for his people. It is never about cannibalism. The ancients, Jews, Greeks, Romans and even barbarians were, all, were almost without exception far too sophisticated for that. But it is about a ritual. And what seems so puzzling in the feeding story is a self-evident truth in light of Christian experience. One seemingly insignificant meal on a Palestinian hillside. For this, after all, is John's account of the origins of the Eucharist. Give or take a few unhappy New Testament scholars feeds not just 5,000, but all who come to Jesus for eternal life. It contains the fundamental truth that Jesus had nurtured billions scattered across time and flung to the far corners of the earth by his one offering of himself. Who knew that so little could feed so many? Who knew that one life could save and transform a cosmos. End quote. As Father Fergus says, this sixth chapter of John's Gospel is foundational for what should be the roots of Eucharistic theology for Christians. As such, this passage brings to the fore how then we understand the Eucharist today which is perhaps particularly apt at the moment. Controversy over the Eucharist has occurred several times during this ongoing pandemic. In the Melbourne Diocese, we have refrained from distributing communion in both kinds, that is, both bread and wine. We have just been distributing bread. We do this in the knowledge that in receiving the bread, despite not sharing the common cup, we nevertheless 
fully partake in the fullness of the sacrament of the altar. A new, very unfortunate trend in thinking has arisen in regards to the Eucharist and vaccines. The blood of Jesus is my vaccine was how one of the signs read at a recent protest against lockdown regulations in Sydney. In an article published during the past week in The Conversation, Professor Robin Whittaker writes that while our tendency might be to roll our eyes at such ridiculous anti-science views, these kinds of anti-science sentiments have an unfortunate, long and complicated history in the Christian tradition. On social media platforms, a small number of Christians are offering a pastiche of biblical symbols to link the idea of Jesus' blood and protection. In one video, Professor Whitaker writes, a man claims we know the blood of Jesus will protect Christians in the 21st century from COVID because the blood of the Passover lamb protected the Israelites in Egypt, in Exodus 12. As an analogy, at best... It's a stretch. Colina Koltai, a vaccine misinformation researcher with the University of Washington's Center for an Informed Public, points out that appealing to people's beliefs and values in spreading vaccine misinformation, or perhaps misinformation generally, is particularly potent. Such views can be extremely hard to combat because doing so is perceived as an attack on someone's core beliefs. While different Christian traditions hold a variety of theological views, at the heart of the Eucharist is the idea that the bread and wine we share are ritually shared as a way to have communion with Jesus and with one another. In bread and wine, Christ sacramentally gives his body and blood to those who receive it in faith and thanksgiving. Twisting this theology, these fringe groups have emphasised that drinking wine in the communion, then, is drinking the blood that saves and therefore will protect against disease. While for some, Jesus' blood is spiritually invoked through prayer, other misinformation that links the protective power of Jesus more explicitly to taking communion. Taking communion daily, such people claim, prevents you from getting sick, such as from COVID. In a neighbouring parish to ours, the vicar has had to refuse requests from people who want to buy communion bread and wine in the belief that taking it daily will prevent them from contracting COVID. Anglicans, we should note, do not teach that communion will protect you from sickness and clergy across the world have urged people to be vaccinated. The association of the Eucharist and healing were around, of course, long before COVID. In 2013, Pope Francis uh, addressed exactly this issue in a sermon stating that the Eucharist is not a magic rite, but a way to encounter Jesus. The reformers, we would be well to remember, were adamant that superstitious understandings of the Eucharist could become rife if good theological reasoning was twisted. Father Andrew McGowan, professor at Yale Divinity School, has written extensively on the history of the Eucharist. He has said, The Eucharist is always an enacted sign of the love and regard for community shown by Jesus not a talisman for personal gain or benefit, end quote. In this sense, 
uh, Professor Whitaker writes, it is only like the vaccine in that it exists for the good of the whole community, not just ourselves as individuals. It is a twisted theology that treats the sacrament as something to be gobbled down in private and not within the community of believers. McGowan notes that there are more early Christian stories indicating that wrongly taking the Eucharist could do you harm than there are ones suggesting communion will bring healing. In several post-biblical apocryphal stories, bread and wine are shared after a healing miracle as a means of thanksgiving and confirming faith, but it does not bring physical healing. Similarly today, communion is regularly administered, administered to the sick and dying. It serves as a reminder of Jesus' salvific action to people of faith, not as a magic pill or healing potion. Indeed, traditional Christian churches usually anoint the sick with oil for healing or have other prayers for healing that do not involve communion. However, Professor Whitaker writes, one can see how superstitious ideas developed linking re recovery from illness to the body and blood of Jesus. To do so is to conflate spiritual well-being and physical health. While spiritual health can correlate with other forms of health, mental, physical, and so on, it is not the same thing. The vast majority of religious leaders are urging people to be vaccinated. No healthy Christian teaches that taking communion will magically protect a person against illness. Yet the line between taking the Eucharist for spiritual wholeness and taking it as a magical potion that will protect one physically remains thin enough to be abused by irresponsible people touting conspiracy theories. To do so is preying on the vulnerable, a most anti-Christian activity in the guise of religion. John chapter 6 can reground our theology of the sacrament back into Jesus' own words. Without twisting theology to suit ill-construed political agendas or medical paranoia. Not only that, but perhaps as we immerse ourselves in this sixth chapter of John's Gospel, we can realign our theology more broadly with who God is, what our faith is, how we understand God's church, how we understand the sacraments, and how we interact with the world around us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us affirm the faith of the Church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us join together in the prayer which Jesus gave us. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Keep our nation under your care. And guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Send out your light and your truth. That we may tell of your saving works. Have mercy on the poor and oppressed. Hear the cry of those in need. Hear our prayers, O Lord. For we put our trust in you. Grant, O Lord, that we may see in you the fulfilment of all our need and may turn from every false satisfaction to feed on the true and living bread that you have given us in Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let your request be made known unto God. In everything give thanks. Most merciful and loving God, in you is steadfast love and hope. Hear us when we pray for all people and for your church throughout the world. Loving God, we pray for all the nations of the world, their leaders, their peoples. In every age you have fed and sustained your people. Here today we pray the cries of those who suffer starvation, oppression, imprisonment, or war. And teach us how to live together in harmony and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, its clergy and people. You feed us with your body and blood and sustain us with your living word. Meet us today, we pray. In the breaking of the bread, may we know the risen Lord. Make us together one. And as we share, send us out to feed your hungry people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for all in need, for all those who feel friendless, for all those who mourn. We pray for the sick and for the dying, for those in anxiety and distress. We pray to you during this ongoing pandemic praying for all those who have contracted the COVID-19 virus, for their families and friends, and for all who respond to their needs. You have pity on all who call on you, and you offer wholeness and hope to your people. Bring comfort and relief, we pray, to all who suffer anguish, pain or grief and to those who care for them we pray give tenderness and skill lord in your mercy hear our prayer loving god we pray for all who have died in the faith for your holy people of every age for those from this parish who have gone before us to eternal life at this time we particularly pray for Layla Beaumont, Eric Rees, Edward Black, Dulcy de Cruz, Hildred Carla, and Graham Lindsay Bride. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Long ago, you fed your chosen people in the wilderness and brought them safely to the promised land. Feed us too, we pray, with the bread of heaven, and with all your saints, bring us home to the place you prepare for all who love you. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have given us grace to agree in these our prayers, and you have promised that where two or three gather in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, Lord, our desires and prayers as may be best for us. Grant us in this life knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life eternal. Amen. We continue to pray together, saying, Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We conclude this time of prayer together with the words of the grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.